Oh, hey guys, it's brilliantly uh, Big Insect Games here. And I've had a dilemma recently, almost as big as this insect. Friend of the show, Ham Man, has been whispering things in my ears at night, and he's very persuasive. Buy more ham. Eat more ham. Smell more ham. There's a 20% discount on ham at your local grocery store. What are you looking at? Have you never seen a ham man before? I've already found myself at the grocery store looking for that 20% ham discount that he promised me. And to add insult to injury, it was a complete lie, but I bought a ham anyways. So I'm kind of scared to see what I might do if this keeps going on. But to put an end to this little shenanigan, I challenged him to a game of chess. If I win, he promised to stop whispering things in my ears at night. But if he wins, I get sent to the Shadow Realm. Seems like a pretty fair deal if you ask me. But don't worry, because I've been practicing Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters on the PlayStation 2 for months in preparation for this. So there's really not much of a chance that I lose. If you're skeptical, let me show you how Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters in the PS2 prepared me for the most important battle of my life in the form of a video game review. That's really the only way I know how to communicate. Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters was released in the PS2 in 2004 and was based off of the spin-off Yu-Gi-Oh! action figure game that was in the manga and later in real life. And when I say spin-off action figure game, I mean Yu-Gi-Oh! but chess. Surprisingly, this game came out before the Capsule Monsters filler arc in the original anime, which was how I knew about it. Good thing I did the bare minimum amount of research because I was fully ready to say that the game was based on the anime, which would have made me wrong in the internet. Truly dodged a bullet there. As a young boy, I never actually bought any of the figures, even though I kind of wish I did. But being a Yu-Gi-Oh fan, this game ended up in my grubby little hands at some point. And like Transformers the game from the last video, I don't remember when I got it, but all of my memories in life are from the post-receiving Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters era. So for all I know, it was brought to my doorstep by a strange man in the night. But after that point, it kind of stuck with me. Every once in a while, it would stare back at me from the old PS2 collection and I'd pop it in. I even played the whole thing like six years ago with the intent of making a video about it, which was clearly an idea lost to the sands of time until now. But I'm finally going to right my previous wrongs and talk about this game. Right away, you're greeted with a fully voice acted Grandpa Moto. <laughs> And he tells you, Yugi Moto, that by some means you've been entered into a Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters tournament, with a lot of ominous individuals. So it's time to build your Capsule Monsters deck and beat each person in all four areas to make it to whatever the secret fifth area is and win the tournament. I decided to use this premise to make things a little bit more interesting. When I played this game six years ago, I remember it being a breeze to go through. I don't think I lost a single battle. So I decided to treat this like an actual single elimination tournament. If I lose, then I'm knocked out. Which I won't have to worry about because I'm kind of a god gamer over here. With that all out of the way, it was time to choose my symbol aka my king. The way it works is that you choose one of the 8 elements that you want your symbol to be. Each monster in the game has one of these elements associated with them, and if it matches the element of your symbol, they get boosted. On top of this, there's a Pokemon type chart thing going on where certain elements are good against certain elements, which I had to look up every single time. All of this basically just means that in hindsight, choosing a light attribute symbol and using a lot of dark monsters throughout the story probably wasn't the best choice. Choice. The rest of the symbol changes are purely cosmetic, so I made mine look very funny. After this, you invest points into either AP, MP, or PP. MP is the amount of money you start with to get monsters in Grandpa Moto's store. PP is your symbol's health, and AP is how many monsters you can summon, move, or attack with per turn. I put everything into AP because you get MP after every battle, and if your symbol is getting attacked, you definitely messed up along the way, but being able to move more pieces is always a good thing. With symbol in hand, it was time to choose my monsters. Choosing the starting monsters was a big decision, but I was confident in my star-studded cast. You got the deceptively filthy Happy Lover, the terribly tasty Steel Scorpion, the wide-eyed and witty Rootwater, and the inexpensive Drollbird. Don't get too hyped about this monster lineup because I made too many changes over the course of the game to really keep up. Unfortunately, I have to use this intimidating cast to take out my favorite character, Joey Wheeler, right off the bat. Ah! Something to note is that as a person who's a fan of the anime dub, the voice acting in this game is very nice. You get to hear Yugi, Joey Wheeler, Merrick, and Weevil Underwood in all of their glory, all talking trash to you. I'll tear you down like termites! 
fights would I love Kevin! After listening to your opponent's monologue, each battle starts you out with a set of amount of MP and a maximum amount of monsters that you could use. Bigger monsters cost more MP, so this means that you can't bring all heavy hitters like root water. You gotta sprinkle in a droll bird here and there. This means that you have to find a good balance of low and high MP monsters, so you can have the best monsters while also deploying as many of them as possible. I don't think there was ever a situation where not deploying the max number of monsters was the right play, so a lot of times it's sacrificed using a bigger and cooler monster for bringing two of them. After your monsters are on the field and summoned, they each have their own movement and attack patterns like Fever Dream chess pieces would. Some can attack a few squares ahead, some can attack diagonally like pawns, and some pieces can move diagonally and only attack in a grid pattern two squares away from them, effectively meaning you can't hit anything with them on certain stages. So it's also important to choose a monster that has an attack pattern that makes sense for the stage that you're going to battle on. Monsters also gain experience after a battle and for damaging and killing your opponent's monsters. When they get to 100 experience, they level up and get stat boosts. Some monsters can even evolve into stronger monsters at certain levels, and some monsters can fuse together to form a stronger monster like in the card game. The most important thing of all, however, is that when you attack the opposing monster, you get to watch a cool animation. It adds a little more excitement to getting a new monster because you get to see them in action. Luckily you can turn it on and off as you please because as cool as they are, the game would be unplayably slow if I had to watch them every time. On the tippy top of all of this, there are the boards themselves which are differing against every opponent. Each board powers up certain elements at certain squares, and sometimes even damages monsters of the wrong element. For example, Root Water is powered up in the water in the Joey Wheelie stages, and unfortunately, all of his skeletons are powered down by it on his home turf. I liked this mechanic and was always interested to see what the next board's gimmick was. And while I was dumping information on you, I strategically and tactically outplayed Joey Wheeler in every way possible. And by that I mean I started with one extra monster and basically just did a one for one trade of my other monsters until it was just my root water against his severely weakened fire reaper. And when you beat somebody you get to take two monsters from them of your choosing. In the initial stages, the monsters you could steal are all buyable in the card shop, but eventually you get to steal people's signature monsters and it's very satisfying. Now that you know how the game works, I'm going to take you through the key moments of my Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters tournament, starting with Tristan Taylor. He was noteworthy because he was barely able to take out a single monster, due to being a talentless hack that rides on the coattails of his friend's success. After that waste of time, I was confronted by the creator of Dungeon Dice Monsters himself, Duke Devlin. I was a little bit scared of this battle because you know how I said when I tried to make this video before, I beat everybody without losing? Well, there was another time when I played this game about two years ago when I wanted to do the same challenge that's in this video, and I lost to Duke Devlin. So all I could say is that I was incredibly nervous because losing the third battle would be embarrassing. And it didn't really take long for my worst fears to come to life. My Joel Bird had stubby little arms that could only hit diagonally one square, and my potato with limbs were clearly no match for Duke's Karibo and Steel Scorpion combination. His strategy was genius. Karibo could do the heavy lifting up front with his bulk, and the Steel Scorpion stayed back and sniped me. He also just outmaneuvered me with the limited movement that the stage offered, which wasn't considered in my calculations. On top of this, I mismanaged my Steel Scorpion and Fire Reaper combo, failing to take into account how much of a glass cannon they are. Basically, things did not go well. Before I even knew what happened to me, I was left with a banged up Droll Bird and my Root Water against two Karibos and a Steel Scorpion. This seemed completely hopeless, and images of people making fun of me for losing in the third battle while I cried and cried started to form in my head. I managed to take out a Karibo, but my Droll Bird immediately got traded off, and it was just one lonely Root Water versus the world. This is where Duke's hubris got the best of him, and he made a fatal error. Instead of sticking to the fundamentally sound strategy that got him here and just killing my Root Water, he went for my king with his Karibo, and kept his weak Steel Scorpion in striking distance of my Root Water. This allowed me to pick off the Steel Scorpion and continue to use my King as bait for the Karibo. And this very cool and not lame strategy worked incredibly well. Instead of going for my full health Root Water, Duke attacked my King. And since my King is Light Element and Karibo is Dark Element, it only did 47 out of 160 damage. This gave my Root Water plenty of time to finish off the Karibo and win the battle. This also cemented Root Water into the Capsule Monsters Hall of Fame for me, and its praises will be sung in the halls of Valhalla. 
which is really a fancy way of saying I bought a copy of its card on eBay for a dollar. Drollbird had a valiant effort too and has become a personal favorite Yu-Gi-Oh monster of mine. But $200 to $300 is a little bit steep to induct a monster that attacks diagonally one square into the Hall of Fame. Lucky for me things got easier after this point because Taya was my next opponent. I'm bringing her up just to talk about how cool this stage looks and how sick the music is in this game. It's a city and when the clock strikes a certain hour, it starts snowing and the music changes to a song that would be fit to play at Frosty the Snowman's funeral. I'd highly recommend listening to some of this game's soundtrack even if you don't play it because it's randomly incredible. I'll have some of it in the background throughout the video. The battle itself ended in a 5v1 which is by far the most lopsided battle so far. Even more lopsided than Tristan Taylor. But it was at least pleasant getting there. Yuki's grandpa is the last battle of Area 1. He gives me this whole with age brings wisdom speech but his two best monsters are a small sword wielding cockroach and a floating right arm. Yeah sure buddy boy, that's a lot of wisdom you got there. After you beat an area, Grandpa Moto adds more monsters to the store that you could buy, which was something I always looked forward to. This time around I got a Summon Skull and Rock Ogre Grotto number 1. These ended up becoming deck staples. Weevil and Rex pretty much went down without a fight because of this, but Weevil at least had one of my favorite stages and songs in the game so I enjoyed doing it. Mega Tsunami also went down fairly easily, but he had the coolest signature monster by far up to this point in the Fiend Kraken. I definitely enjoyed swiping it away from him after crushing him. My Valentine, however, was the first to put up a fight in a while. My didn't start off too hot because she charged her one-eyed shield dragon straight through a mob of five monsters. It immediately died, but unfortunately my Droll Bird got banged up in the process and died the next turn because of it. I definitely haven't been using Droll Bird as bait every single battle, so don't accuse me of that in the comments. Things got sketchy the next turn because I arrogantly charged my freshly stolen two-headed King Rex into battle to avenge my Droll Bird, but it got destroyed. Maya also had her two harpies which could move very quickly and hit hard because their board boosts win monsters. I managed to double team one harpy but the other one managed to one shot my steel scorpion. In hindsight I don't understand why I was still using this thing because it only has 140 HP and having high HP is probably the most important thing in this game. So this one is on me if I'm being honest. On top of this my root water and wicked dragon of the ursad's head were damaged eventually killed leaving a 3 on 3. Really sad to see the leader of the team go down for the first time all tournament. And to add insult to injury, I know it's all my fault because it's a water monster on a wind stage. Luckily I cleanly took out two of her monsters in the next turn, leaving a 3v1 which I easily won. You've really gotta wonder how my valentine would have done if she started with the same number of monsters as I did. That was really the only slightly hard battle of area 2 because Mokuba went down without a whimper. At this point I felt like I was cruising in area 3. I bought this cool cursed dragon, my root water was done serving the one game penalty for dying, and I was feeling great. Unfortunately Bakura decided he was going to put up a fight. One immediate problem I ran into was that there were two narrow pathways at the start of the board due to this pretty but awkwardly placed tree. This made getting everybody out way harder. This powered up the crazy range of the winged dragon guardian of the fortress and feral limped even further, letting him take out my cursive dragon for free. To add insult to injury, my poor monster placement left me unable to take out one of his monsters the next turn, which means I had to endure the entire onslaught again. After this, things really started to take a turn for the worst. I lost Droll Bird and Root Water, and Summon Skull was finished off by Queen of the Autumn Leaves. The new team member Prisman was also doing no damage at all to the winged guardian dragon of the fortress. This left me with a desperate decision. Do I try and take this thing out or do I go straight for the king? I decided to take it out and then go for the king because surely both Heartbeat Lady and Prisman combined could do it, they couldn't. I now had to try to take Bakora's king out with a lone Prisman, but I was one turn too late. My fate had been sealed the turn prior when I made the awful decision of not making a run for it with Heartbeat Lady. I was knocked out of the tournament and I was left not knowing what to do because it was relatively early in the game. My decision was to play the rest of the game for the video, but I would have to be punished for my failures. And what punishment could be worse than having to take a sip out of the cauldron? Who even knows where this came from and what unforeseen effects the green liquid inside could cause? Well here goes nothing I guess. It's actually not too bad. victim to the sweet juice of the cauldron and now I can't feel my limbs.
I ended up losing the Bakura again on my very next attempt, and then to multiple other people on my path to unlocking the secret fifth area, which actually makes me feel a bit better because I wasn't anywhere close to beating my challenge. These losses include the first shoddy battle where my monsters got stuck at the beginning of the stage because they moved in a zigzag, but the opening of the stage was a narrow straight line, and Yami Bakura because his Pumpkin King was a menace. The funniest one of all was Kaiba because I spent so much MP on Firewing Pegasus that I neglected my own advice and didn't use the number of monsters I could. And then I immediately charged Firewing Pegasus to the front line of battle where it would die a horrible death without doing anything. But you'd be lying if you said it didn't look cool while doing it. Other notable battles were Pegasus because the music was great and Ishizu where the battle was over immediately but the stage was like 3 times bigger than it needed to be and she just ran away from me for like 10 minutes until my monsters finally finished their voyage across the stage. Easily the worst battle in the game, and it highlights my biggest problem with it. In chess, each turn you have to move a piece, even if you don't want to. In Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters, you can just choose to not move anything and wait for your opponent to overextend. This is important because having one more monster usually decides the game because you can just trade down after that. This didn't come up in every battle, but when it did, it was annoying. But regardless of Ishizu shenanigans, I unlocked Area 5 and it started with a battle against Pegasus. I by all means should have lost this battle because it was just my Dark Summon Skull and my severely damaged Great Moth against the Light Rogue Doll, and I couldn't do much damage to it. Luckily for me, Pegasus just decided to not attack me at all with Rogue Doll. Well, there were too many red wine spritzers that day for Pegasus, I guess. A rematch against my favorite menace to society who I absolutely love playing against Ishizu was up next. I was winning the whole time and then spectacularly fumbled the bag at the end due to not being able to figure out how to attack her monsters with mine. This was the most painful loss next to Bakura because it wasted a lot of time. It was fine though because I witnessed a beautiful metamorphosis in the following battle against Merrick. My level 8 root water that I've been using the whole game finally evolved into High Tide Gyojin. I could cry honestly. It destroyed Merrick without remorse despite the stage being covered in lava. In the shoddy rematch, my Great Moth also evolved into perfectly ultimate Great Moth, giving me plenty of firepower for the final battle, which was a rematch against Kaiba. In the final battle, there were no MP requirements for the monsters I could pick, so I went absolutely ham and picked Firewing Pegasus, Barrel Dragon, Gaia the Fierce Knight, you name it. The only unfortunate thing is I couldn't use Droll Bird because it was serving as one game death suspension. Kaiba's last team was also very good, with two Blue Eyes White Dragons, Meteor Bee Dragon, and a Skull Guardian as notable members. But being able to use the strongest monsters I've gathered all game was just too much for him. I triumphantly marched a victory and was crowned the Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters champion. I had a lot of fun with this game despite it being a bit slow and repetitive at points. I think part of it is my familiarity and love for most of these monsters. There's definitely some nostalgic value here. And this made collecting and acquiring more of them even more fun. It was also just great to hear some of the goofy voice acting from the show. It's definitely a worthy game to stare at me from my video game collection shelf. And if you like Yu-Gi-Oh! I'd recommend it. But if you'll excuse me, I have some unfinished business with a certain man of ham. Now that I've learned from my mistakes in a safe PlayStation 2 game setting, I can finally checkmate him. Look at how much I'm already winning by, it's not even close. Checkmate. Hey, it's not so bad. At least ham man's not whispering to me anymore. Buy more ham. Roll around in the pit full of ham until you smell like ham. There's a 20% discount.